Welcome back, everybody. My next guest tonight is a correspondent for NBC News. His new book, Separated Inside an American Tragedy, is a New York Times bestseller. Please welcome Jacob Sobarov. Jacob, good to see you again. Good to see you, Stephen. Now, uh, here's the book, uh, Separated. Um, and it's specifically about the family separation policy instituted by the Trump administration. Um, it, it's, it's only been a few years since you first started reporting on this, but in, it's dropped out of the news in a large way. Just remind us about this extraordinary, extraordinarily cruel act of policy that was used as a deterrent against people. It was, it was an event that united the country. I'll never forget covering it myself and seeing you uh, talk about this to, to your audience. I mean, it's something that got people outraged in a way that I haven't seen as a reporter before. And when I say, you know, I saw it myself, I was inside those facilities. I was inside that former Walmart, 250,000 um, square feet. Uh, you had 1,500 boys, 10 to 17 years old, living inside for 22 uh, hours a day I went outside for recreation two or three hours, depending on the day of the week. They were watching Moana when I was in there in the loading dock. Um, they were doing Tai Chi. They were playing pool. It was um, bizarre and terrifying, to say the least. And then a couple of days later, on Father's Day 2018, I went to the epicenter, what the government's almost the epicenter. And that's where the kids were laying on concrete floors under those blankets and supervised by, you know, security contractors in a watchtower. And I could not... I believe what I was seeing with my own eyes. And that's why I wanted to do the book because I, I didn't understand how did America do this? How, how in our name was the United States of America doing this uh, to these children? I think it was the same questions you were asking um, at the time. And I did this for myself, but for everybody else too. So well, well, let's talk about how, how we got there. Look, the, the Trump administration decided to use this uh, cruelty as deterrence, didn't they? Yeah, they called it, um, they, they, they called it as such. John Kelly said that on CNN in March of 2017. And what they ended up doing was torturing, in the words of Physicians for Human Rights, which won a Nobel Peace Prize, um, 5,500 kids. And the American Academy of Pediatrics called it government-sanctioned child abuse. And they did it on purpose. And they did it to scare people away from coming to this country. Is this policy over? No. No, it's not. Uh, you know, the ACLU says since the end of the policy, the so-called end of the policy, that over a thousand kids have been separated. And, and I don't think Trump wanted it to end. In fact, I report in the book as much when he was going to visit tornado victims in uh, 2019, he whispered to Kirsten Nielsen on Marine One, we gotta reinstitute that. And she says, we can't do it. And Melania who's sitting there says, no, 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 no. And Trump says, we'll see, we'll see. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, could he bring it back worse than it was before? I think the answer is yeah. The, the, that is just a, a chilling reminder of what the stakes of this election are, is that in, in some small way, Donald Trump might be fettered by trying to reach out to voters right now. But if he's reelected, he um, has no constraints over any act of cruelty he wants to inflict on these people. Um, and the, the lasting damage you talk about in here is extraordinary. There are still children who haven't been re reunited with their parents, correct? It's almost unbelievable to think about. Literally on the ground in Central America are nonprofits because the government doesn't want to do it. The government turned over phone numbers and addresses, and you got nonprofits going around Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador, and they basically have to stop this process because of COVID, but looking for kids because the record keeping was so shoddy. It's why the reunifications were so um, disastrous at the time. But now there's this entire additional group uh, that we still don't know who they are or where they are or if they have been uh, reunited yet. Do, do you have any sense of how many kids it is? Over a thousand. That group is over a thousand um, children. And that's why they're on the ground, because literally um, they did this without a plan. They didn't have a plan to reunite. In fact, there were people who had plans. I mean, and I call them heroes, uh, civil servants who pushed back on the policy tried to stop them from doing this because they knew that this was gonna be the result. And ultimately the Trump administration uh, pushed forward with this uh, anyway. And, and it was the disaster that these folks had predicted. Um, is, is it true that there, um, there was no process in place to keep track of the kids, partly because they started doing it before the policy was announced? Yeah. And therefore they couldn't have a record of it? 
Yeah, and it goes, by the way, it goes back to the Obama administration when this was happening in very limited circumstances for the safety of the kids. There was a guy, Jim De La Cruz, who was keeping track basically in an informal spreadsheet. And he was saying, if we're gonna separate, um, the best way to reunite is to not separate at all because the systems aren't talking to each other. So ultimately, when they got to the point um, that the list that this guy was keeping leaked to the New York Times, Scott Lloyd, who was the Trump appointed head of the refugee agency of the federal government, his first instinct was to get rid of that list. And he told subordinates he wanted to get rid of the list. You could read all about the encounter. And what ultimately happened is, again, because of the heroes that cared about these kids over Trump policies, they refused to do it. And that, that to me, that was such a critical point that could have been far worse. This critical linkage between parents and kids um, would have been destroyed. And who knows what would have happened to those 700 and 400 parents were deported. Um, without their kids, even though they kept the list. Last week, it was reported that 8,800 unaccompanied migrant children were expelled from the U.S. because of the pandemic. Is Trump now using COVID as a cover to further his immigration agenda? Bingo, exactly. I mean, and it's what he's wanted to do, Stephen, all along. Uh, during family separations, government officials, including the woman who's now Stephen Miller's wife, uh, told me she was a spokesperson for DHS. The whole goal here was to be able to kick kids out of the country as soon as they got here, no matter where they came from, and to hold families in ICE prisons indefinitely. And now using COVID as the excuse, they've locked up families and are not letting them out, despite a judge saying, let these children out right now because of COVID. And now over 8,800, as you said, uh, children have been expelled immediately because of public health. And what's incredible about that is there's been reporting done that shows that the kids they're deporting don't even have COVID. They're using COVID as this excuse for the immig restrictive immigration dreams they've had all along, and they wanted family separations, basically, uh, to make happen. Jacob, we have to take a quick break, uh, but stick around, everybody. We'll be right back with more Jacob Soberoff.